Now what will it be? Death or exile? Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the TV Exiles. This week we'll be looking at the final ever episode. Yes, you heard me right. <laughs> Through my teary face, this is the final episode of Star Wars The Clone Wars and it's titled Victory and Death. As usual, joining me for this review is fellow Star Wars enthusiast, Brandon. Hey Chris, I'm here wiping my eyes too. <laughs> right, let's get into this then. So, it's obvious from the beginning that this is the end. The episode opens with a familiar score from Padme's funeral in Revenge of the Sith. How did this set the tone for the end of the arc and the series as a whole? I mean, it was it was a pretty powerful way to open this episode in, in something so dark, in, in death, essentially. Uh, even though, you know, it picks up immediately where we left off and the score goes away, mm -hmm. just that, that small funeral music was just, it was, it was telling you exactly where the show was going to end its season. And it's, and I, I mean, the show as a whole was, was not going to be in a good place. And yeah. I loved that they did that. Yeah, completely agree. It was a, a somber episode. It was also in, in parts exciting and thrilling, but. Overall, you'd have to say that the tone of the episode was quite sorrowful. And, um, yeah, I think the way they kicked it off with that score, it really got you in the mood. Speaking of the start, we kind of speculated last week who was breaking into the room. Could it have been a Mandalorian? Could it have been Maul? Could it have been the clone troopers? And we did find out that, yes, it was probably the most obvious answer it was the clone troopers and yeah then ahsoka and rex proceeded on their attempt to escape the clones were still trying to enforce order 66 so they had to battle right through them so what were your thoughts on how the two did work their way to get off the ship i mean it was it was thrilling right again right from the start we we see the clones trying to cut in and kind of a, a brilliant move from Ahsoka. She just shoves the door right on to, to the clones, uh, knocking a few of them out. Um, you know, it, it starts right from the beginning that she wants to, to avoid killing any of them. Uh, yeah. So tells Rex to set his, his guns to stun. and then Which I always love that graphic. When the stun beams go out and they expand, they're just brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's it's kind of a, one of those iconic moments from from A New Hope when yeah. when Leia gets hit by the the bolt. Always look brilliant. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean the, their escape getting out of that room was was well handled. They were you know overpowered for a short amount of time, but yeah, they were able to get out of there and start working their way to 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 find a way off the ship. Yeah, for sure. And they weren't the only ones trying to get away, of course. Uh, Maul was trying to as well. Uh, he was continuing his brutality from episode 11. Uh, very unstoppable force yet again. And he goes into the reactor room and tries to pull the destroyer out of hyperspace. Like, what did you think of Maul's role in this? I mean, like you said, it, 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 brutal. Uh, you don't often see Maul get to use the the Force very much. He's he's definitely a more combat centered. He he's always been you know a light user of the Force, but in this he's he's picking up guys and throwing them and pushing uh, blaster fire into other soldiers. That was sick. <laughs> uh, and that was really cool. And even just the moment of taking the helmet and throwing it into another guy using the Force to to kind of knock him over. Yeah. One of the bits in there that I really liked was where he tore the command center up and you could see a body of one of the officers there and he just swiped it away with the force. Oh, that was yep. just ruthless. It out of the way. Yeah, like it was nothing. Like he's just, yeah, like he's worthless. Like he's just a battle <laughs> droid. Like, <laughs> uh, my question was, I, like, I didn't see him get hit by anything. I was wondering if he was hiding under there at first. Yeah. Uh, but 
Uh, it wouldn't have been very clone like, but yeah, the yeah he was just getting getting that footing for what became just a, a really really epic shot of him using the force to to rip the hyperdrives right out of the yeah it of was, the, the ship. It was fun, and then, and of course that's what caused the accident. Yeah, and, and seeing the the ship fall out of hyperspace, kind of falling apart already mm. with the smoke trails. I mean, one it looked like a movie. Uh, yeah. that was just phenomenal looking and just showed you immediately that, that he did more than just stop the, the ship from having a hyperdrive. He, yeah, he crippled he, he the tore ship. Thing apart, yeah. <laughs> so this is one of Maul's moments of showing huge feats of force power, like you mentioned. Um, but also Ahsoka did that as well, which like you mentioned again is, is rare. How did these moments work for the story? Um, for you as a member of the audience. I mean, I loved it. I love seeing her, you know, in, in her desperation is be able to reach up and grab the ship as, as Maul is escaping on their ship to, to reach up and, and grab it using the force yeah. and keep it from leaving was, you know, again, we, we just, we don't often get to see big feats of power using the force. A lot of times it's little things, uh, the, that all add up to something, but this was something big. And especially for a, you know, a younger, I guess she's not a Jedi, but a younger force user, like a Stoka to, to have that amount of power. Uh, it, it goes to show that, you know, the, the force isn't just, you know, linear. It, it, it's on demand. She, she's an amount of desperation. The adrenaline is high and she was able to, to reach out and channel more to try to stop it. Unfortunately, didn't end up mattering she had to let it go to save rex but Mm -hmm. uh again just yeah i thought it was kind of you know a chills kind of moment yeah and it it kind of exemplifies the evolution of what is the hero and the villain of this series we followed both maul and ahsoka throughout this and getting to see them at the peak of their powers in the final episode is is perfection really for me yeah yeah i mean the only way it could have been any better is if you know just to compare it to ray and in rise of skywalker now we are ending the podcast <laughs> <laughs> you, I have been exi- you, you have been exiled you have been exiled from the exiles <laughs> god fucking damn it you're fired we're releasing that in the podcast i had to, i had to say it just to get to you <laughs> All right, then let's get back on track and talk about some real Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this being the series finale, we're obviously going to go through a full range of emotion as well. What are some of the moments that really, really stood out to you? Uh, yes. I mean, <laughs> the, the whole thing was, was very emotional, but obviously the... The moment when they're in the control room, uh, uh-huh. and and they see that the all the clone troopers and Jesse are are in their way, and you kind of have that breakdown where one you know Ahsoka shows the reason why she's she's such a good Jedi is because she's such a good person. She yeah. exemplifies what the Jedi are supposed to be, and she refuses to kill the clones because they are her friends, and she knows they're not acting out of their own free will anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Rex gets it, and he he understands that they're probably going to have to to do something. But you know he he kind of has his his breakdown moment and when ah- Ahsoka pulls off his helmet, and he has that tear rolling down his cheek. That you know it's it's him and Ahsoka against his brothers, and there's nothing he can do to stop them. Yeah, he can't just reason with them. Yeah, and we'll mention the score a bit later as well. But the score in this moment really hit hard it was so emotional and yeah just kind of got you in the mood for that deep conversation between Ahsoka and Rex Rex being the you know the typical soldier hiding his true emotions beneath his helmet so that they couldn't be seen but you could still even feel it in in the voice acting that this was this was someone that knew they had to die because they were willing to kill. But then, like you mentioned, Ahsoka saying, look, these guys might have to die today, 
but it won't be at our hands. And I thought that was just beautiful writing. And I think Dee Bradley Baker's delivery in this episode and all of the voice actors throughout the whole of the seven seasons have been magnificent. Um, But I just wanted to give a shout out to him um, for this scene as well, because his delivery was brilliant under the mask. You could feel the pain beneath the mask. And then when the mask came off, you could see it as well. Just a beautiful scene. Yeah, and it only goes to to kind of reiterate what we've we've said in probably about every review we've ever done for this show. It's just one of the, the main successes of this series has been humanizing the clones. And mm-hmm. if they didn't do that, then this moment means nothing. You don't feel anything, but because we do understand what is happening, you, you feel bad for the clones knowing that they're out of control. But, I mean, you just you get that moment that, that Rex is feeling where you, you wouldn't have before. Yeah, and we were talking about an emotional range throughout the episode and sadness and having that emotional connection with the characters was one, but then the other end of the scale was the suspense and tension. Like that scene where they're trying to fight their way off at the end, you know, Ahsoka holding the the ship with Maul in it, then releasing it and then fighting off the clones and then the ship's going to crash into the moon and they're trying to fight their way off and they find the Y-Wing, Rex gets off, Ahsoka's flying through the sky using the force to try and guide herself towards the the ship. It was just, oh man, the, the tension. I was gripped to every frame. How did you feel during that? Same, I mean... It goes to as a testament to the to everybody that worked on this show that there's just you know what happens to these two characters you know that they survive you know that they're in another an, another show together but you still feel that tension wondering what's going to happen to them and that's really really hard to do on something like a prequel where you know that they're both going to survive but some somehow you feel like the they're in danger. Yeah. Uh, brilliantly done. Uh, one thing that in that whole thing, it, it's not necessarily, I guess it's part of the tension is they're being overwhelmed and she, she throws her lightsabers into the floor and, and spins using it. We've seen that before in, you know, underworld and even one of the deleted scenes from episode three, mm-hmm. but never where she, somebody had held the, the lightsabers by, <laughs> <laughs> by using the force and spun yeah. around and cut, cut a hole in the floor. I thought that was really great. Yeah, that, that was probably one of the best moments um, as well. Some And some of the others was like when, the, when they were dropping the clones down and they were just disappearing, like all these clones were just shot away. That, it's like, whoa, okay, that was cool. But then when she did that um, with the lightsabers, that, that was magnificent. That was brilliant. And- Again, one of those things that the, these four episodes in general have just been very, very serious, been very adult, and the the droids playing with the the clone troopers, kind of launching them and dropping them, <laughs> could have come off childish, but it never did. It never nah. felt like a gag. <laughs> it felt like I mean, those ramps go up and down to get to yeah, the service even, level. Even when they shot them up, it didn't look ridiculous or funny. Yeah. They, they didn't add like bowling yeah. noises to the bodies rolling <laughs> around like like some movies do. It, it was kind of funny, but it it, yeah. it never took you out of the moment. Exactly. But when the droids were getting destroyed, you felt bad for droids. I mean, it, it's not R two. It's the first time that you've ever cared about a droid that yeah. wasn't R two. That, that scream though, uh, if it if it don't break your heart, nothing will. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, the, especially you know, one of them kind of being the the precursor to Chopper and Rebel. Basically, yeah. Uh, and I mean, it was played by Dave Filoni, and he was pretty funny. But they're just sitting there launching, and you didn't think that the clones would would actually open fire on them because generally, you know, the bad guys are like, "Oh, they're just droids; they're leave them alone." Exactly. But no, they, you know, all the droids died trying to get Rex and Ahsoka off the ship, and it, mm-hmm. you know, that that's something again that you add an emotional level to a, a piece of metal. Yeah, brilliant, brilliantly done. Um, so then we get to the final part of the episode and we just get this huge chunk of the episode with not a single word being spoken 
like I think it's around eight minutes long with no words. And the last thing that we did here was Rex telling uh, Ahsoka to, you know, come on when she was trying to get off the Star Destroyer and kind of land on the Y-Wing. So did you even notice, like, how long it was? Or were you just, like, engrossed by it and forgot that there was no other words to be spoken? Like, the, uh, the, the season ended with no words for the last eight minutes. That's quite rare. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a huge chunk in there. And, I mean, I did notice, but not in a in a bad way. It was just, it was immediately noticeable. To just so much was happening on screen. And then, you know, after the, the ship goes through the clouds, and, and that's kind of the moment that I noticed. Uh, the, the destroyer goes through the clouds, and then they go to the, the crashed ship. And I noticed just the, the soaring music, which was wonderful, uh, and just the complete lack of dialogue. And then the second time I watched it, because I have watched it probably half a dozen times already, <laughs> not an exaggeration. It's just it's kind of wonderful that they're able to have all that suspension, all that storytelling, all that action, and then all that sorrow and sadness and emotion at the end without a single word of dialogue. Yeah. It just it's a testament to the entire series and the characters that they've built. But, you know, especially these last few episodes and just the story that they told where they could end with, you know, a big chunk of an episode not having any dialogue. Yeah. When you can go eight minutes in a 22 23 minute episode and it's the final episode of a whole seven season series if you can do that and it be amazing and that you don't feel that you've lost out on something you have to give big props to the composer kevin kinner the director the showrunners like to make you, as a member of the audience, not feel that you were cheated out of something in terms of storytelling or dialogue or anything like that, that, yeah. is, that is massive. I, yeah, I agree. It's just they were, everybody was just working at the, their peak. Every, nobody was, was taking a day off. Nobody was sleeping on the job. And I'll They say came it, to deliver something powerful, and they, they really did. And I'll say it, give Kevin Kinner all the Star Wars movies now. John Williams is retired. We don't need to look elsewhere. Give it Kevin Kinner. All the movies, all the series, everything, just that it should be his job from now on. Yeah, he's he's done great. I'd, I'd be interested to see with a, um, a big orchestra what he does, because even with a small orchestra that he's done on these episodes and and the one in season five where, where Soka gets framed, he did all that with a, a small orchestra instead of just a computer and... Yeah. And since it's just he did wonderful and, you know, everybody talks about how wonderful the, the score for movies like Blade Runner 2049 has, has been or even Tron where they have that really mm -hmm. deep synthetic sound. And this just nailed it in a way that I didn't think would be Star Wars, but it just fits the material ah, so that, incredibly that well. Is, that is Star Wars. That that just yeah. felt so Star Wars. -y. And again, eight minutes eight minutes in a season in a series finale and also the scene with rex and ahsoka the guy just did some of the best work probably i would say the best star wars score outside of the lucas films yeah i would i would agree and you know in its own right it's so different that it's even hard to compare the intention in its storytelling i think is is far different than william's scores but you know, to to be able to leave a 35-year-old guy crying <laughs> at the end of a cartoon, th that says you did your job well. There, There's different kinds of composers, and John Williams has always been one that al almost has a, a theater-style feel, feel where the, the score is almost telling a story of its own. Uh, Instead of being a character within the story, uh, Hans Zimmer, I think, is better at being a character within the story, mm -hmm. and John Williams is better at, at telling its own story. It, there, neither is the the right way or the wrong way. Just a different, just two different methodology. Approaches. Yeah, different approach. And 
when it fits the material perfectly, it does. Like Zimmer scoring Gladiator. You couldn't imagine Danny Elfman scoring that or or John Williams or, mm-hmm. you, you know, Michael Giacchino, who I who I really like as well. But, you know, something like this just it fit everything so beautifully. And it was a character of its own. It was darkness. It, you know, it was the the end of an era. And it just it really fit so wonderfully. It's it's just it's really hard to describe. It's I'm so yeah. glad that they released it because it is available uh, on digital streaming. Yeah, I think you've put it perfectly. It it felt like a, a character, a part of the episode. It was brilliant. Um, so let's talk about that final scene a little bit more. How did it leave you feeling for Rex and Ahsoka? Distraught. I mean, again, you know where they end up, but there's still a blank space in there and just you feel bad for you know both of them rex has never he was born for war the the literally the only reason he was mm. he was bred was to be a warrior and now you know life has changed and ahsoka yeah. the same thing the the ideals and the training and everything she was taken from her family for i mean willingly but everything that she has been raised on is gone now and she is now a a fugitive she she now has to run for the rest of her life essentially there is a a level of darkness over the universe and she senses it right there and but you know even more so you know the personal story that even after all of them tried to kill her they took the time they buried every every one of their friends right there Mm -hmm. and put their helmets on display Mm -hmm. uh there's just there's such a beauty that even in on a galactic standpoint, what what has changed for both of these characters, the relationships and the the friends and and everything like that, that is what is more important at that moment. That the those were people, those were their family, those were their friends, and even though they they were no longer in control of what they did, they they got a respectful burial. And, you know, I, I thought that was. Uh, just a testament to the the kind of people that they they have been written to be, obviously, but that Ahsoka and Rex really are. Yeah, the the death of um, Jesse and the other clones was really really emotional, and especially seeing Ahsoka leave her lightsaber there, you pretty much know that she knows that Anakin has turned to the dark side now, so. She leaves her lightsaber there because she knows if she takes it with her, anyone seeing her with it will know that she is a Jedi and the Jedis are, of course, an endangered species at this point. And also it's the fact that her master, her brother, gave it to her and he is basically not who she thought he was anymore. And, yeah, she had to leave part of him behind because, really, he was gone as well. Because now it's Vader, it's not. Yeah. It's not Anakin. It's Vader, and it's you know it, it's kind of a double meaning because, you know, obviously she's going off of what she felt through the Force and what Maul told her, but ultimately she doesn't know. But either way, she feels that he he's no longer the part of the Force that she felt. Yeah, we don't know if she was told explicitly or not, but she she for sure has that that feeling. She's got yeah. Her. She felt it right before Order 66, you know, what had happened and that Anakin was involved. Um, But even if he, she doesn't know that he, uh, obviously, nobody knows who Vader is at this point. Um, You know, whether he survived or not, you know, that that is a last piece of him. So even though she's letting herself go and she's burying Ahsoka there, she is also burying Anakin because that was his gift and he changed the the blade to blue to be you know a part of him as well so you know it, it's letting go of of anakin it's letting go of of the jedi it's letting go of her past it's it's just overall letting go she didn't set it down she she just let it go yeah yeah and speaking of darth vader what do you think was going through his mind when a few weeks months however long it is later he finds ahsoka's lightsaber well, I would say it's obvious that he is there because they found that specific ship. Um, it, they didn't just randomly find a ship and then randomly oh, yeah. find find that it's her. 
but I think the the detail in this that that gives everything away is the the inclusion of being able to see through his lenses and see Anakin's eyes underneath mm-hmm. and see the the person underneath. I, I, I think that for the first time as a Star Wars fan in, in my life, I actually finally felt the tragedy of Anakin Skywalker uh, that it was kind of where the, the prequels did fail. I, I really enjoy the prequels, but they never made me feel the tragedy of Anakin because he wasn't incredibly likable. Uh, his turn wasn't incredibly given. It, it wasn't something that, that always really worked, but when you include the show, it does. And you realize that he was knowing that he was the chosen one and knowing that he would bring balance to the Force and he would destroy the Sith. But he at, at the end, he wanted he just wanted to be a father and a husband and he was promised something by the Sith and then didn't get it. After giving everything up out of fear of losing, he still lost everything. He lost his wife. He lost his children. He lost his little sister, essentially. He lost his trainee and Ahsoka. He even lost his limbs. I mean, he is a carcass of a body in that suit, but you can still see that there is a man in that suit. And I think, you know, grabbing that lightsaber solidifies for him his failure. Uh, just across the board that he has nothing left. Uh, the galaxy is in a very dark place. He is not powerful enough to overthrow the emperor. And he is just relegated to, to being a servant for the rest of his life, essentially knowing what he lost and how he failed. Yeah. And speaking to the humanity of Darth Vader, it's really interesting how he knelt to pick up his Padawan's lightsaber as if he was kneeling to say a prayer uh, at a gravesite. Um, it was him humbling himself to what was before him and picking up the lightsaber as well. He didn't just use the force or anything to, to lift it. He, he knelt down and picked it up. And I just want to say about the visual effects in this scene as well. It really wouldn't surprise me if this was mocap. It probably wasn't, but it was uh, It was stunning. It was just so high quality. The way the cape moved in the wind was just magnificent. And I think it was just a brilliant scene. Some of the cinematography there was fantastic. You know, the wide shots, seeing him approach the gravesite, kneeling down, picking up that lightsaber and just staying there and then looking at it and having that moment of thought and then walking away. But circling above, before he walks away, we saw an owl. What do you think that symbolized? Uh, it's uh, it's Morai, which is the the sister from the the Mortis story arc from season three, uh, and also that it plays a big part in Ahsoka's arc in Rebels, uh, and it you know kind of goes to show you the the through thread in all of this that Anakin is is down below and he was touched by the brother and ultimately became the evil that that he was promised and circling above what he believes to be the grave of Ahsoka or what he might think is the grave of Ahsoka is the sister who gave her life to to save Ahsoka's life and is now part of Ahsoka and part you know possibly part of why Ahsoka is more powerful and more pure than than many others, just because the the sister is part of her. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it, you know, maybe it tells Vader that there's there is hope, uh, that there is life, and you know, maybe there there is more to the to the galaxy than just the hatred that he feels. And then you see him walking away from the site in the reflection of a visor of a clone helmet. That is some of the most amazing visual storytelling I have seen in Star Wars because it is the end of Clone Wars so you've got the clone in there the helmet is cracked so you know like the clones or the spirit of the clones is broken but then you've also got their general Anakin now as the bad guy in there looking down upon them and then walking away from them 
abandoning them. Some of the most amazing visual storytelling in Star Wars history. Yeah, and something to note as well is that it's not just a clone trooper's helmet. It's it's the clone trooper with the, the Ahsoka paint job. So it's I mean he is walking away from from the clones, but he's also walking away from Ahsoka because that's what's there. I mean that's that's what's left behind, buried in the eyes. You've got the whole thing. You've got Ahsoka. You've got the clone. You've got what was Anakin walking away. It's just perfect. So, yeah, here we are at the end of the episode. And um, do you have any final thoughts on it? Any special mentions? I think we we pretty much nailed it. Just, you know, Filoni stuck the landing so well in all of this. I mean, everybody did. Everybody that returned. Everybody that gave it their all. Kevin Kenner, you know, giving a fantastic score. Um I'd say, you know, the only thing I wanted more out of this episode was maybe five extra minutes. Uh, but, you know, part of that is just because it's moving so fast uh, that it, it just blows by. It, it doesn't feel like it's like it's 23 minutes long, but uh, that's not a complaint. I want the, the quality that's there. It just I I would always want more, um, but it just it worked so well. And not many shows get to end on this much of a high note. And. You know, when you when you look across the Star Wars fan universe, there's so many divides. There's there's original trilogy, sequel trilogy, prequel trilogy, uh, Disney movies. There's there's just so many elements, and nobody agrees on anything except Clone Wars. This is the one thing that I've not seen anybody say something negative about. Everybody is united that that this is just wonderful Star Wars. So, you know, it's great to see a, a moment of, of unification on everybody that, that wants to, to smack each other all day long. <laughs> to be able to enjoy one thing, doesn't matter if you're 10 years old or 40 years old, we all got something out of this. And that's the Star Wars I want. So, yeah. uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm incredibly sad that it's finished. There's just been so much in this series that has really filled me with joy and happiness and sadness and all the emotions that you you come to expect from Star Wars. For me, this, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, The Clone Wars is the best Star Wars content we have outside of the original trilogy. It's just perfect, and this final arc... In this final episode, did nothing but rubber stamp that feeling for me. I'm I'm glad they came back for this season, um, and you know I would love them to come back for more. Obviously, it probably can't be St- Clone Wars, but maybe we can get some life after Clone Wars. Maybe we can get this animation team together again to tell some different stories. Because what I will say is, I did love Rebels. But the animation quality and style of Clone Wars as well is, for me, was much better. I don't really have much more to say other than the feeling that I had all those years ago when we didn't get any Clone Wars again is the feeling I'm experiencing again. And that's, again, because of how good it is. So, no, I think we we just begin our rewatch tomorrow. <laughs> from season yeah. one all over again and we, we're always going to have this Clone Wars with us so nah, that's, I'm, I'm just very happy we we got what we got sad that it's over but forever grateful Yeah, I will say that uh, I've, I've said for a long time that Disney needs to move away from the original trilogy but now ending this I just, I kind of want to spend more time between the end of this episode and A New Hope I want to see where some of these characters land and done in the, you know, the level of storytelling that's been given here, whether it be, you know, small four segment arcs that are just standalone or, you know, just uh, two hour animated movies. I don't care how they do it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's great storytelling to be told. And there's obviously a demand for some of these great characters. And if you do them right, 
then then continue bringing on the content. Do it. Don't just milk it because you think you can sell some. Let them tell great stories with great characters, and then let the fans reward you for for a great product. Because that's the perfect business model, in my opinion, is when the fans get get rewarded for for the their trust and the corporations get rewarded for their risk when, when those two come together you you just have something that is untouchable agreed agreed unfortunately where i want to see star wars the clone wars these characters go is somewhere where they can't go because what i really 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 want to see now is ahsoka and anakin either animation or live action and i want to see that play out um and unfortunately because they've established that they don't see each other again until rebels which is many years after this arc that really isn't possible so where do i want it to go other than that i just want to see more of rex i want to see more of ahsoka Ahsoka is my favourite Star Wars character and I just want to see more and more of her, whether it be animated, whether it be live action, I don't care. But I, I want to see her evolution continue. Uh, agreed. Um, I'm, I'm always nervous about the, the jump from animated to live action because you're obviously not getting Ashley Eckstein in there. Which is, you know, the voice that's that's where all of her character comes from. But if mm-hmm. if the rumors are true, I think that Rosario Dawson could be a very good fit. Yeah. Um, and with Dave Filoni in charge, I, I trust that he would not, uh, for lack of better terms, would not half-ass, you know, this character's Yeah, show. he ain't ruining, he ain't letting anyone ruin that character. No, that that is his, and you know they can they can handle this character right because, like you said, that this is she's my favorite Star Wars character now. Um, mm-hmm. She's absolutely right there next to to Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. It's just the best. Yeah. Um, I want to see her. However, I can get more stories. I don't care if it's books or comic books, but I think that they've proven their point with this season of of Clone Wars to to Disney that people want to yeah. see this in animation. Oh yeah. And I'd love to see them even just. Uh, redo some of the books that have been written, whether it be the Darth Maul comic books or the Ahsoka book or the Dooku book, however you can, you know, expand on this universe. Yeah. Give me a two hour, two plus hour animated film, any story, you pick it. <laughs> if Falone is in charge, I don't care if it's live action, animation, it really doesn't matter to me. Just give me more great stories like this with that yep. great, great character. So that will do it for this review for this series of reviews we'll be back again on the film exiles and the tv exiles reviewing all kinds of other series but it's been a real pleasure to talk about these episodes with you brandon it's been a journey we went through some ups and downs let's say the first arc i thought was really good the second mini arc wasn't really to my taste but everything in this final four weeks has been truly magnificent and i think we really got our teeth into this thing so thank you for taking the time to review these with me it's been a pleasure reviewing them with you and why don't you tell the good people of the galaxy near and far where they can find you and talk about some star wars with you you can find me on Twitter at the underscore meatball underscore 84. Good stuff, good stuff. And I've been Chris, and you can find me on Twitter as well, at Vinaldo7. Come and speak to us all about Clone Wars. Hit us up at the Film Exiles on Twitter. If you like the video, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you like our content. And until next time, stay exiled.